Welcome to another Nature Trek podcast, where we bring wildlife to you in your living room. In this episode, 30 years at the RSPB, tour leader Tim Melling talks about his career as a senior conservation officer. And I'm your host, Sarah Frost, Nature Trek's marketing manager, normally based in the head office in Chawton, but this podcast is once again brought to you from lockdown in Alton. Hello and welcome to another of our podcasts. Now, preventing the illegal persecution of birds, halting environmentally damaging building developments, working with farmers to improve habitat for wildlife, and climbing up steep crags in the Peak District to protect ring oozles, it's safe to say that working as a senior conservation officer for the RSPB isn't your standard office job. But this is indeed what tour leader Dr Tim Melling has done with his career. Tim has been a leader of Nature Trek tours for 20 years, guiding our groups in far-flung corners of the globe, from the Arctic to the Antarctic and a hundred places in between. So if any Nature Trek travellers are listening, the chances are that you've been on a tour with Tim at some point, and he's joining us today from lockdown at his home in the Peak District. Hello, Tim. How are you? Welcome. I'm very well, thank you, Sarah. Now, Tim, can you give us an overview of your role at the RSPB? You had a long career there, didn't you? I did. I started in the late 80s and I worked until May last year, which was over 30 years um, working there. Always in the north of England. I've never worked anywhere other than the north of England uh, my entire life. Uh, I started off doing press and media work there and then latterly moved into uh, more pure conservation work. And I suppose my job was mainly about trying to uh, protect important sites for wildlife against damaging developments. Um, When I first started, I remember being told, oh, well, you concentrate on sites that have got protection. And I was thinking, well, why do you need, you know, if sites have got protection, why why do you need to uh, uh, get involved with those? Because they're protected, aren't they? And then as I learned more about it, I found that even the most highly protected sites in Britain, you know, with, with European level protection, British protection, none of them are sacrosanct. All of them leave loop holes for developments to take place if it's uh, for social and economic reasons. Um, But the trouble is, is that uh, the developers are always trying to push that as far as they can get and uh, uh, to to make sure that they they get the development to go ahead. But once uh, a development goes ahead and you've lowered the bar and allowed a damaging thing to take place, that then sets a precedent for future developments because people say, oh, well, you let him build his uh, um, uh, nuclear power station next to that triplessi why can't we do it here and it's difficult to come up with an argument not to when one's already been allowed so uh, that's what i did i was trying to stop the most damaging development and trying to broker deals for wildlife to make sure that uh, it was taken into account with other developments to make sure that uh, it minimized damage or was compensated for Right. So clearly what many would regard as a crucial role and a very worthwhile career indeed. And I suppose it might be hard for you to pick one thing, but what was the main challenge you faced when trying to accomplish all of that? Uh, I mean, uh, partly was the... uh, uh, was the government really because whichever government's in they always see the economy as being much more important than wildlife and if there's any kind of playoff between jobs and birds uh the the birds always seem to lose out and um so that 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 was uh, so every single time it was an uphill struggle and the uh, most of the uh, designations were handed out more than 20 years ago and the government decided that these were actually quite restrictive yeah because it meant that yeah, it made it difficult for them to do damaging developments in places that have been designated as a triple SI. And so they really weren't keen on designating new ones. But I managed uh, through dogged determination and working with others uh, to get 
the West Pennine Moors in Lancashire designated as a new triple SI about four four years ago. And um, what I de- uh, what, what happened was when uh, the European level protections were uh, were handed out, they uh, what they they concentrated on the sites that had were best for birds, but then just I- ignored the rest so that they weren't uh, de- designating too much. But then when something called SACs came out, special areas of conservation, which was uh, areas that were of international importance for the habitats and for the species that were involved. Now, the the government agencies were rather lazy because they have to do lots of uh, consultations with landowners before they designate their land. And if the land was already designated for birds, it was much easier just to designate it for its habitats as well and and, and tick that box. And what we found was that the West Pennine Moors in Lancashire were far, far superior in terms of habitat quality than the, the, than the South Pennine Moors, which was a, an internationally designated site. And yet the West Pennine Moors had no designations whatsoever. And because it was uplands and windy, uh, uh, you know, all the wind farm developers wanted to sort of uh, uh, chuck uh, uh, wind turbines on top when, uh, you know, most of it was pristine blanket bog with four or five metres of peat and, and, and rare birds like merlins and dunlins and twite nesting there. So, uh, uh, but anyway, with dogged determination, I managed to get that designated. So now it is protected and I know that I've played a major part in that. Well, well done you. And you just mentioned wind farms and wind turbines. So I expect they were a huge issue for you during that time. Are they were they a big problem for birds? Yeah, they, they were a big issue for me, Sarah. Yeah, I, I, I was because uh, I worked th- uh, right from the beginnings of wind turbines when nobody had even heard of them, right through their heyday. And um, most people uh, um, thought that uh, birds would fly into them, and so that's what most people's general aversion to them with birds was. I mean, m- many people didn't want one in their backyard, so they used to contact RSPB and say, "Oh." The skylarks and all sorts of things you should be objecting to it but what they found out was that by and large birds don't fly into wind turbines in the same way that they don't fly into brick walls or or um you know um t- t- telegraph right, uh, that's, what, that's what most people think isn't it most people think it is, that, yeah. you know, the swan is going to fly into a wind turbine and get hit and and yeah uh, that, that's what you sometimes perhaps just yeah. rarely and that's what you only really remember yeah. you you hear about in the news it is, but but uh, so, so they, they occasionally they do fly into uh, wind turbines, but usually when the weather's really bad, like when it's pouring down with rain and birds can't see so well, or when it's foggy. Uh, but most of the time they're okay with it. And you mentioned swans. Well, um, big birds like swans are, are more susceptible to deaths by wind turbines for a couple of reasons. Um, w- one is that they are less manoeuvrable. So if in a foggy situation a swan was flying and all of a sudden it noticed uh, with wind turbine blades in front of it it would have very uh, it would have great difficulty in avoiding it and doing a, a u-turn whereas something like a swallow could easily turn but the other one is that there is actually a lot of empty space between the blades and i always think uh, that if, if you stood next to a wind turbine with a bucket full of uh, cricket balls and started throwing your cricket balls through the wind turbine blades, you would probably get through most of the bucket without actually hitting a, uh, a blade because it would be going in the fresh air in between the blades. But if you tried the same thing with a javelin, because the javelin takes much longer from start to finish to get through the blades, um, you know, one javelin and, and it would be clattering on the blades. So for that same reason, swans are much more likely to get hit because they're slower flying and longer longer than something like a swallow or a small bird and also because swans are big they're slow breeding and so you can have more of a population impact but by and large uh, most uh, wind turbines are not um, a problem for collision but they are a problem for displacement birds don't like to uh, uh, breed or some birds don't like to breed and, and 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 rest when you've got great big wind turbines turning nearby some birds are more skittish than others but this so a wind farm can have a sterilization effect up to about half a mile so if you start building them on the edge of protected areas what it can do is sterilize an area of moorland for the for the for the dunlin and the golden plovers and things 
like that that it was designated for. So uh, again, we were trying to get wind farms moved away to areas where they weren't going to cause a problem with displacement or, or, or with collision as well. I was actually involved with one off Blackpool of all places. Most people think of Blackpool as a sort of a cheesy seaside resort, but off Blackpool there is an area called Shell Flat, which is a shallow shoal of sand. Um, and out there, we didn't realise at the time because nobody goes out there, but there were. Um, it, it was the, the the most important site in Brit in in England for common scoters. Uh, there were about thirty thousand common scoters wintering on Shell flat and this was one of the areas that the government had licensed for a huge 90 turbine wind farm and common scoters are one of the most hysterical ducks you know it, there's hardly any good photographs of them because nobody can get near to them even at sea they're always flying off when they're and and so uh, wind turbines would scare them but all the associated helicopter and boat traffic for uh, uh, me, uh, me, uh, me, repair and maintenance would also see off those birds so again we thought that and won because it was uh, that was such an important site for common scouters there wow well that, that, that's fantastic um and we hear a lot about uh, problems that birds have with wind turbines we also hear a huge amount about illegal uh, persecution um of, of birds particularly birds of prey um and was that an issue in your area and something that you worked on quite heavily as well yeah, oh, that was a massive issue, Sarah. It was, but it's so difficult to to, uh, to actually convict. Uh, I, I once found a trap that was uh, baited with a live pigeon to catch goshawks. Uh, and uh, again, we never got a conviction out of that. And one of my colleagues actually videoed um, somebody shooting a hen harrier on an RSPB reserve that was next to a grouse moor. And again, we didn't get a conviction because um, uh, this chap was wearing a ski mask and he flatly denied it was him and said it was somebody else dressed like him and we couldn't prove it because uh, there was a he had a ski mask on and he, he got off scot-free so um, so we had to try and find some other way of, of demonstrating because they were in denial that the shooting fraternity said oh this never never it doesn't occur you know how many convictions have you had but when we know that we can actually video somebody killing it and not get a conviction we know and they know how difficult this is so we approached it another way in the peak district because uh, peregrines and goshawks are hated by gamekeepers because they eat grouse there's no two ways about it they eat grouse they eat pheasants now um but they have traditional nesting areas and what we were finding was that these birds of prey were disappearing from the peak district so we weren't actually finding a smoking gun we weren't finding dead bodies we were just noticing that the birds were disappearing so um, now the Peak District has, it's divided into two. We call it the Dark Peak and the White Peak. The Dark Peak is the peatland areas with the grouse moors on it. And the White Peak is the limestone areas. Now, both of these have populations of goshawks and peregrines. But we noticed that the Dark Peak population was plummeting downwards and the White Peak population was going upwards at the same time. Yet they were only a few miles apart. So what we did was we, uh, and, and uh, when I say that these birds simply disappeared, if somebody went along there and shot birds on a cold February mid midweek uh, wet day when nobody else was about and managed to shoot peregrines and goshawks, they wouldn't occupy that territory. So we looked at the occupation of territories compared with how uh, uh, the, 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 the nearness, the proximity to grouse moors. And what we found was that a territory of either a goshawk or a peregrine uh, for both species was only half as likely to be occupied if it was near a grouse moor. So, um, uh, uh, so that was the first thing that there was no logical explanation for other than persecution. But when uh, a territory does become occupied, what we were finding was that the nest would suddenly disappear uh, or that, you know, the contents would or the nest would fail. And we also looked at the statistics of that and we found that if so for the half of the nests that did continue on grouse moors for goshawk, 
dogs, they were only uh, uh, th those nests were only half as likely to uh, fledge any young compared with the ones away from the grouse moors. And for peregrines, it was a staggering three times more likely uh, uh, there. So um, uh, th that's, you know, there's no other log logical explanation. You can't blame diseases or, you know, natural predation, not when these areas are, you know, only five miles apart um, are there. And uh, so also we looked at the uh, convictions, uh, sorry, uh, the, the uh, absolutely confirmed uh, evidence of, uh, of, of bird persecution. So a shot bird, a poison bird, a trap bird, where there was 100% no doubt that this had been done by humans. Um, and we plotted those geographically. And then we looked uh, as a surrogate for grouse shooting. We looked at the intensity of grouse moor burns because gamekeepers burn moors for, for grouse there. And we found that, uh, that the intensity of grouse moor burning and the number of persecutions of these birds uh, was absolutely correlated. So basically, the more uh, grouse moor management there was, the more persecution incidents you, you, there were. And at the same time, we were showing that there were a fewer birds there and they were having uh, greater, uh, uh, poorer success on the grouse moors. So that was a, you know, a really neat piece of work. We got it published as well. It was in the journal British Birds. And, um, and uh, you know, but that really, really showed that, uh, you know, just the, the underlying nature of, of, of what is going on here with the uh, uh, illegal persecution of anything that is uh, detrimental to grouse. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely astonishing to me what a, a battle this has been for you and, and continues to be for other people working in your sector mm. um, still today. And forgive me for asking uh, such an obvious question, but it's a question that so many people uh, I'm sure will be wanting to know is why is it so difficult to actually get the persecution? Is it purely because uh, even when you hear of uh, cases when there seems to be such damning evidence um, mm. and the people it, it, still get off scot-free, is it because people clearly just don't, don't care enough about the wildlife? And even when they do get persecuted, the, the punishments seem to be so limited. And so, uh, you know, it's just the equivalent of a slap on the wrist. If, if uh, no, it, it's a, uh, it's a really good question in that Sarah. But just imagine if I was up in the Peak District with my camera and I saw a gamekeeper and I could take his picture and then if I saw him shoot a say a hen harrier out there, I I I mean I could probably photograph the dead hen harrier. I could photograph the gamekeeper, but to actually get the shot the shot of of him shooting with an identifiable uh, photograph and that going down because first of all he could claim that somebody else had shot it and it was already there but moreover he would go over and retrieve it and that bird would then vanish so there is no evidence and then he would say well I was a bit closer to you you know it was a crow you're blind you don't know what you're looking at and you know and he's right you know there isn't a court in the land that would convict him if you haven't got the body because he's got rid of it um, and that 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 is why the game for uh, shooting industry don't like um, uh, satellite transmitters uh, because what these are sh uh, showing is that a satellite transmitter on the back of a, of a peregrine, a goshawk, a hen harrier will, uh, you know, it works perfectly well for years and then uh, the bird wanders onto a grouse moor and then all of a sudden it just miraculously stops working and basically what happens is somebody illegally kills a bird of prey finds it's got a transmitter on and then has to um uh, you know smash it up and get you know damp destroy it but what that's it shows where the last transmission was uh and if that was on a grouse moor and we're finding that that is time and again what is happening um so yeah but th this is why it is so difficult but even that isn't enough to convict somebody even if all the hen harriers that have been satellite tags stopped working on the moor there is still not enough evidence there to prosecute a gamekeeper because you know nobody's actually caught him it could be that those tags have just stopped working it is it's a it's a real nightmare of a job to get a conviction Blimey. and do, do you think, uh, this may be difficult for you to say, but do you think that with pressure from conservation groups, the, the business of grouse shooting may be, become a thing of the past or at least just decrease? 
I, I think it will. It may get licensing. It may be licensed. It may be uh, be even outlawed. Uh, but but I, I think that things will come not not, not just because of the uh, uh, co collateral uh, uh, illegal persecution of birds of prey, which does go on on grouse moors. There may be the odd grouse moor out there that isn't, but by and large, it, you know, the the, the whole um, uh, the, the whole industry. Is, is is based on on removal of birds of prey um, but, but uh, the, the other thing that they do is they burn the blanket bog and the deep peat up there now farmers were banned from burning stubbles just for air health and pollution reasons uh, many many decades ago but for some reason the, the gamekeepers are allowed to carry on burning the moors and you know I see this thick pall of pollution on burning days it happens time and again and and all that burning and it's completely unnecessary and it's bad for climate change as well because what that is doing is basically releasing all the uh, carbon dioxide that has been taken out of the air by the cyclone mosses it's you know it's reversing uh, all the climate change benefits so you know e even for no other reason they should stop burning the moors even if they carried on grouse shooting but uh, and if they can't clean up their act and they've shown that no, no not even moves in that direction then you know i think that the the you know that uh, the, the time is up really for driven grouse shooting mm. Well, let's watch your space then, perhaps. Um, but Tim, tell us a bit more about the um, the other conservation of other bird species that you've worked with. I know that you've worked with um, twite, haven't you? And ring oozles. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Uh, tw twite is an interesting one. Twite is a little dull brown bird like a linnet. It's seriously in need of a PR champion. <laughs> it's, most people have never heard of it, but it, it's, it's got a more, uh, it's got, the, I think, the, the most restricted distribution of any bird in England. So it, it only breeds in a tiny little area, not far from where I am at the moment, in uh, the, the South Pennines and North Peak District. And um, yeah, there's probably about 100 pairs left in this area. Area. And it's one of very few birds that feeds entirely on uh, on seeds. M most seed eating birds like chaffinches and sparrows will turn to an insect diet when they're feeding their chicks because they've got lots of protein. But twite doesn't. It carries on feeding just on seeds. So uh, and it only nests on moorlands. So it needs an abundant supply of seeds next to uh, next to the moors. And traditionally, this has been hay meadows. Um, uh, but two things have been happening. One is hay meadows are a real rarity now as uh, silage has taken over because silage can get two or three cuts a year off. Uh, you see these great big toothpaste coloured plastic uh, uh, bales in the fields and that means that it's all wrapped up long before the, the, the seed is even set. Uh, so there's just no food available. It's really bad for curlews and uh, skylarks and all other things as well. But the other thing that happens with uh, hay is that they're cutting earlier and earlier Earlier. So quite often when the birds are still feeding their youngsters on the seeds, the farmers quickly cut because they don't want the rain to come and uh, ends up getting bailed and again there's no food and the babies are starving there. So we've been working with farmers in the areas, in the favoured areas where twice still are, to ensure that they carry on, uh, well we've been getting grants so that it pays them to carry on managing in traditional uh, uh, areas and also to try and turn a few of these silage meadows back into the traditional hay meadows which actually look nicer as well and so much better for wildlife as i said it's better for bumblebees butterflies skylarks curlews lapwings you know all the birds that like the upland fringes it's good for so uh, and you're right i did work on ring oozles as well ring oozles was a different issue um Ring oozle is the upland counterpart of blackbirds uh, and they nest in the Peak District again not far from where I am now and uh, they uh, but they're a very shy bird much more skittish than blackbird and they like to nest on on peaks and there's one great big long uh, uh, millstone grit edge in the Peak District I and mean, it's several miles long it's called Stanage Edge and uh, it also happens to be the most popular climbing crag in Britain people come from all over 
England to come and climb on Stanage Edge. It's so famous. You know, it's so long, there's many of them. And when the weather's good and when there's lots of climbers there, the birds just cannot get a look in. Uh, you know, there's nowhere that they can get that hasn't got climbers on. But when the weather's bad, they stay away and then the birds start nesting. And then what we can do is we can put restrictions up to keep climbers away. Once the birds have started nesting, but the climbers won't keep off and let the birds nest in the first place, that was a battle that we never ever uh, won. But if the birds can't get on the crags, which is, you know, the nest behind Heather and Bilberry actually on the cliffs, but if they can't nest there, they tend to nest in the bracken beds below the cliffs. Now, you think that that would probably be okay because, you know, people aren't wandering in there. But the trouble is, is there isn't much cover from above. And when a bird nests in there, uh, the climbers tend to have picnics and leave food scraps and that then attracts crows and jackdaws. And then when they're flying over, they spot the ring oozles nesting and go and predate the nest. They eat the, the eggs, they eat the chicks. And so uh, invariably, ring oozles that nest in the bracken beds fail. So um, what we used to do was we used to find these bracken uh, nests and we used to get a big blanket of bracken litter and we would put it over the tops of these ring oozles uh, like a roof. And I remember one female was so confiding, she sat so tightly on her nest that she didn't fly off when we put this blanket of of things over the top of the uh, nest so that she had a roof over her so that the crows couldn't see her and so, and we walked away and she was still incubating and she went on to raise two more broods from that that nest that year i think it was 10 chicks in total and i was so pleased with that so uh, wow, so that, that was just one little aside but the main thing was negotiating yeah with the climbers to make sure that they the restrictions were in place and that they didn't climb when we had a removal nest and and talking of climbers thinking about the position that we're in right now um the country is still in lockdown um we have a coronavirus outbreak do you think this may actually have a positive effect on the breeding populations of ring oozle at the moment uh, oh. considering that there's going to be fewer climbers and tourists there now it, it, it will undoubtedly uh, i remember back in the foot and mouth year when nobody was allowed in the countryside that was when we realized that that, that stanage edge it the, the the number of ring oozles on there more than doubled in foot and mouth year because there was nobody disturbing them, they could carry on nesting. And that, that was the, the catalyst that made us realize that something needed to be done. Because, uh, you know, when we had 20 pairs of ring oozles, I think, along Stanage Hedge, uh, when normally it's sort of three or four. So, um, uh, but yeah, I, I do think for ring oozle that uh, all these closures will have probably done it a world of good. Oh, brilliant. Oh, well, there's one positive thing. Uh, one of the, the several wildlife positive things that I've been reading about recently then that uh, could benefit them. Um, so just to go back to Twight, uh, which you mentioned, um, we talked about a few minutes ago. Um, yes. uh, many Twight um, get colouringed. Um, and have there been any major ringing recoveries from these birds that you know of? I asked because I, I remember reading about um, a bird that showed up in Sussex that had been ringed in the northwest somewhere. Yeah, what we found is, so this this tiny population of twite uh, that are in the Pennines, about 100 pairs, all of them go across to the east coast and, um, uh, and, and winter from about Spurn Point all the way down to East Anglia and, and one or two getting around as far as Sussex. But basically they fly eastwards to the east coast. Now, Twight also winter on the Lancashire coast and, and it, it's much closer for them just to drop down to the Rib Estuary and winter there. And there are wintering Twight there. But what we've found with ringing studies, it, they play a kind of musical chairs. All the Lancashire birds are from uh, the north of Scotland and they come down here for the winter and all our birds move across to the east coast uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, yeah just like musical chairs really um, and uh, uh, yeah which I think is, is absolutely fascinating but the other thing that we uh, found is that um, it, it, it historically 
um, Twite did not used to migrate. They used to spend the entire year around the uh, uh, the Pennines. But what they used to, they used to winter in fallow and um, and arable fields there. But uh, because when in the days before tractors, people used to have to keep horses to sort of uh, uh, you know work the farm and to, uh, to to pull machinery and things. So they then had to grow oats for the horses, and we didn't have the you know the transport infrastructure, so people had to grow food. So there was always arable in the upper even though it wasn't very successful arable and then uh, but now with uh, mechanization and, and modernization is that the uplands now specializes in sheep grazing and arable just does not exist in the uplands so they've got nowhere to spend the winter so now they have to migrate down to the uh, the, the salt marshes on the coast where they feed on uh, it's called salicornia um, uh, uh, sea blight annual sea blight that grows on uh, pioneer salt marshes but they're very picky they don't like it in um, they like it to, to be in a sheltered spot uh, because if it's out on the open flats all the seeds get blown out and so uh, uh, out over there and there's nothing for them to feed on so they need it in a sheltered spot uh, to keep them going throughout the winter and um, is global warming affecting the their breeding numbers in in northern england it, it, it's a difficult one. Almost certainly uh, it, it will be doing. And, and we're noticing that uh, things like ring, well, tw twice is certainly getting uh, rarer mm. in, in our areas, but it's still doing slightly better in Scotland. Things like ring oozles are disappearing from the south of England. You know, they're hanging by a thread in places like Dartmoor. I think they've disappeared from Shropshire now. So again, things do seem to be retreating northwards. And we've noticed that Merlins as well seem to be moving higher up the hill. The, the lower uh, ones are there, but uh, which all suggest global warming. But you know, I haven't got the evidence to sort of uh, point there. We haven't done the research to say, oh, yes, that's definitely why Merlins are moving. Mm. And Tim, was it just birds that you were working with while you were at the RSPB or did you get involved with projects that involved other wildlife as well? Uh, I, I, I've always got involved with whatever I used to feel was the best thing to fight the de development with. I actually found that plants were a really good one because with um, uh, with uh, the plants and the habitats that they're in, just say that somebody wanted to build a wind farm on a moor, it was, if you're arguing plants, you can just say, well, this is blanket bog, this is blanket bog vegetation, you're damaging it by, by putting wind turbines on it. Whereas with the um, birds, they can say, ah, well you've only got one pair of golden plover here and if we were to sort of create a little scrape over here then the golden plovers could move there and you know it's much easier to negotiate away so um so i often found that i relied on my knowledge of botany for uh, uh, my battles and it, it was you know i found that i was more successful arguing with plants than i was with birds but sometimes i say i would argue with whatever was needed there was once when there was a um, a wind farm cable that was coming from one of the offshore wind farms in the Irish Sea and they had to get the cable ashore and they needed to, to put it through a, a, an intertidal area of, of, uh, of, of mud flats and then salt marshes and, um, and it was difficult to argue against them from a bird point of view because they said that um, uh, if we do it during the summer, not all the wintering birds that this is important for won't be here. So what we'll do it is we'll start in May and we'll do it. We'll get it all finished by September. But the salt marsh that they wanted to plow up and dig this cable through happened to be the only English site, the only extant English site for a really rare moth called the Belted Beauty um, that was on this tiny piece of salt marsh. And uh, we said that, no, you can't play Russian roulette with the only site for this moth in England. You're going to have to do something else and they were saying well you know there's this there's the substation this is the you know it's got to come through here so what we made them do was something called directional drilling for about a mile that went under the the salt marsh so that nobody went on the salt marsh nobody trampled on it and they could pull this cable through underneath without actually damaging the thing on top so we seemed like a you know a reasonable way because i don't think the moths would have minded if a cable went underneath their salt marsh but they certainly wouldn't have liked it if they'd have got the diggers out and churned up the salt marsh to bury a cable there so uh, yeah that was a little victory and that was for uh, for moths was the one that i won that one on <laughs>
Well, just listening to you, your passion and knowledge for the conservation of our wildlife, no matter how small, certainly shines through. And of course, this is why, alongside a career at the RSPB, you've worked as a tour leader for Data Trek for over 20 years. Um, and I know tours are on pause at the moment. Um, but what have you got lined up for next year? I know you're off to Antarctica. Uh, I'm terribly jealous, but where else can our guests join you? That's so. right. I've got I've got a good year next year, Sarah. Actually, because <laughs> I think uh, I've hopefully got Franz Josef Land, which is a pioneer trip there. A great trip to Kamchatka, the far east of Siberia, which I've led before, and as you say, Antarctica, which coincides with the eclipse down there as well. So we're hoping to see the uh, uh, the, the the total solar eclipse whilst going seeing all the the, the penguins and the albatrosses and, and the icebergs. So yeah, let's just hope coronavirus <laughs> disappears and um, we. Can get on with our lives again. Oh well, I'm I'm optimistic about that. Um, and yes, as a cruise leader and dissertation fanatic, there are certainly destinations that are high on my list as well. Um, well, Tim, that's been a fascinating insight into a long and important career that you've had at the RSPB. If people wish to join you on a tour, they can go to your profile page on our website, the link to which is displayed on the screen now. And thank you so much for joining us. It's been great to catch up. That's great. Thank you, Sarah. To listen to more of our podcasts, just go to our podcast webpage at www.naturetrek.co.uk forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening.